If I am remembered for no other act, I want to be remembered as the only woman who ever voted to give women the right to vote. Are you all ready to fight for our rights? We cannot, we will not be silenced. Nothing has made me prouder than to be your champion. Women have impacted the world in a variety of ways, morally, socially, economically, and politically. One of these groundbreaking feminine heroines, often lost to history, is Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin. She has left a groundbreaking legacy of perseverance and bravery. Jeanette Rankin has paved the way for today's surge of polarizing dynamic women in Congress. A trailblazer, historian, feminist, and congresswoman, the world was changed for the better through the barriers broken by Jeanette Rankin. Without other trailblazing women, Rankin's unbelievable story would never have been possible. Women of the 1800s were homemakers. They relied solely on their husbands and were subjected to their commands. It was unladylike for a woman to speak her mind. The Seneca Falls Convention changed that. It was organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and was the first women's rights convention. It advertised itself as a convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious conditions and rights of women. The participants drafted the Declaration of Sentiments, modeled after the Declaration of Independence. This convention helped establish the suffrage movement and the conditions to get Rankin elected. The makeup of the United States Congress before Jeanette Rankin's victory was strictly male and predominantly white. In the 19th century, less than 20 black men had served in Congress. A few women had tried to break barriers but were unsuccessful. Most women, regardless of their class, were expected to get married and look after their children at home. Professional jobs such as doctors, lawyers, and civil servants remained close to women through much of the 19th century. Rankin was born on June 11, 1880, on a ranch near Missoula in the Montana Territory. She was the oldest of seven children. Her father, John Rankin, a Canadian immigrant and rancher, treated his children all the same no matter their gender, leading her to develop ideals of equal education and power. Her parents were staunch believers in education. These core family strengths led her to become the woman we remember today. Rankin was educated at Montana State University with a degree in biology. When caring for her brother Wellington in New York, she saw the horrible conditions the poor were living in and changed her career path to go into social work. She attended the New York School of Philanthropy, later called the Columbia University School of Social Work. To further her education, Rankin entered the University of Washington in Seattle. It was in Seattle that she truly joined the women's suffrage movement. I've been a social worker and decided that the government controlled so many conditions that women should have a vote. She became a professional lobbyist for the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NAWSA. Her dynamic speaking and activism efforts helped women from Montana gain the vote in 1914. Women of the West were granted greater equality than their Eastern counterparts. As Western adventurers, they were subjected to the effects of nature. They were seen as equals to their husbands, so there was a high probability that they would get killed. Western states established women's voting rights light years before their Northern counterparts. Middle class and upper class white women often enjoyed more flexibility and freedom in the West to travel, to own land in their name, and to exercise control over their children. This abundant independence led to the possibility of Rankin's historic choice to run for the 1916 House seat from Montana. She had two key advantages, her reputation as a suffragist and a politically well-connected brother, Wellington, an influential member of the Montana Republican Party. However, the well-recognized and respected suffragettes of the century were concerned with her seeking office. They felt that Jeanette Rankin's chances were a long shot, and that her pacifism and utterly progressive Western beliefs were in opposition to theirs. As a devoted pacifist, she took a staunch position towards U.S. participation in World War I, and she vowed she would not vote for any American involvement in the deadly European conflict. After the election and her surprising victory, Jeanette Rankin is famous for saying, that her tremendous win led her to be deeply conscious of responsibility resting upon her. On April 2nd, 1917, she arrived at the Capitol to be sworn in along with the other members of the 65th Congress. Brought by her Montana colleague, Rankin looked like a mature bride rather than a strong-minded female, an observer wrote. All of the members of the 65th Congress, right after they were sworn in, and it's this very, very, very long photo with 
over, you know, hundreds of people in it, all the members of Congress, and she's the only woman in the photo. You have to zoom way in to find her. And I think that just speaks volumes to who was in power when she took office and how she changed the face of who could be in power. The same day that she officially became the first female member of Congress, President Woodrow Wilson addressed Congress, encouraging them to pass a declaration of war and authorize United States involvement in World War I. The choice of which way to vote led to a divisive argument between her contemporaries. I knew she couldn't be elected again if she did vote against the war, her brother Wellington said. I didn't want to see her destroy herself. He understood that her electability in 1918 would be extremely low if she voted against the war. The head of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, Carrie Chapman Catt, proclaimed that Reagan's vote lost the women's suffrage cause a million votes. At the same time, Catt announced Miss Rankin was not voting for the suffragettes of the nation. She ended up voting against the war. Resolution, although not allowed to talk in voting, Jeanette proclaimed, I want to stand by my country, but I cannot vote for war. The war ultimately passed 373 to 50. But Rankin established herself as both an active member of Congress and a staunch anti-war and pacifism representative. The Helmet Independent called her a dagger in the hand of the German propagandists, a dupe of the Kaiser, a member of the Hun Army in the United States, and a crying schoolgirl. Others questioned if women were able to be congressional representatives. Miss Rankin's vote is regarded not as that of a pacifist, but rather as one dictated by the inherent abhorrence of women for war, said the New York Times. Later in 1917, Rankin led the fight in Congress to create the Committee on Women's Suffrage and worked on the committee to produce a constitutional amendment extending suffrage to women nationally. She rallied support for it among her colleagues in the House by asking on the floor, How shall we explain to them the meaning of democracy? If the same Congress that voted to make the world safe for democracy refuses to give the small measure of democracy to the women of our country. When they first voted for suffrage in the House uh, in ninth, January of 1918, the House actually voted for it. They had the two-thirds majority, but the Senate did not pass it. A similar amendment, which would become the 19th Amendment, granted women the right to vote, passed both chambers in 1919, after Rankin left office. Rankin decided not to run for the House due to new policies of voting for Congress, and decided to run for the Senate as an independent. This run was not successful. However, she continued fighting for pacifism and women's rights through lobbyist organizations and speeches. In 1940, feeling the time was right for her beliefs due to the prevailing knowledge of an upcoming war, she ran for a seat in the House of Representatives in Montana and was elected. But since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war. On December 8th, 1941, Rankin and her colleagues were called upon again by the president to declare war on a foreign power just days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Again, Rankin broke barriers voting against the war, but this time she was alone in doing so. One voted no, the rules are suspended, and the resolution is breached. After her term ended, she chose not to run again for re-election, but continued to be a vocal advocate for pacifism, including speaking out against the Vietnam War. We ought to know that you can't settle a dispute by violence. Now, next Monday, you plan to lead a, a group of demonstrators to the Capitol, but the Capitol Police have refused to allow you on the grounds. And they'll have to let the women come sometime. They might just as well let them come today. Jeanette Rankin's age did not hinder her social work. At the time of her death, on May 18, 1973, in Carmel, California, Rankin was considering another run for a house seat to protest the Vietnam War. Since Jeanette Rankin broke barriers by entering the United States Congress in 1917, 309 women have since served. I think she'd be part of the Me Too movement. I think she would have been part of the Occupy movement a while ago. In her mind, I think she'd say the more people doing more things, that's just all the better it is. She has spurred a newfound sense of civic engagement, led by a new generation of fierce young women making their voices heard in American politics.